as I begin this morning, let me just say I missed you last week. I really did. I missed being here with you. I guess you could say that I was here in spirit. Let me tell you about our Sunday morning last week. We, had, uh, we were over at Folly Beach in a beach house and uh, having some vacation time and had some kids and grandkids around me. But at 930 on Sunday morning, we gathered together in the den there at the house and we, we did the live stream of Old Fort Baptist Church, which was a, quite an experience for me, if you might imagine that. Um, and we, we, were, we were there, and we were determined that we were going to participate. So when you were singing, we were singing. And when you were praying, our heads were bowed. And when Jason was sharing the kids' corner last week, it uh, dawned on me that it was my turn, and I forgot to get a replacement. So Jason was probably last minute there. I felt bad for you, Jason, but, you know, it is what it is. And, and then as I uh, really appreciated the message that Charles brought about the church. And Charles, my takeaway from that message was that, that image of the bride of Christ that you kind of drove home right there near the end. And I appreciated that reminder that this is God's bride, that we are God's bride. And I missed you, missed being here. I was, I was kind of, sort of here, participated, but it was not the same. I can testify to that now. I miss the church. You see, the, the church is the ecclesia in the New Testament, the gathering of God's people, coming together. It's what it is. And I miss the coming together part. And, and let me be very clear about this this morning. I realized this particularly in that moment and throughout the week as I processed what had happened in my spirit on Sunday morning, it wasn't just any church I missed. It was this church. It was my church. My church family the family of faith that gathers together regularly here at Old Fort Baptist. I missed you. And as I began to, to kind of unpack some of that this past week, I realized that, you know, I've been a part of the church my entire life. You know my story. My, my dad's a pastor and so I kind of grew up in this environment. The church has been a part of my life intricately from its very beginning. And believe you me, I know where most of the warts are. Can I just say that? I know where the ugly is. I do. I've seen it up close and in person many times in my life. But I've also learned where the beauty lies. I've seen the good. And I have to say to you this morning, with all of its warts, I still love this place. The church is God's idea. Intended to be a blessing for his people. And I missed it. And I missed you. In Romans chapter 12 is where we're going to take our text this morning. And if you'll open your Bibles with me there, you're going to hear the conversation beginning about the church. The first 11 chapters is this great theological treatise where he, he spends a great deal of time and energy talking about the how of salvation. God's objective in sending Jesus Christ was to save a world that could not save itself. By grace we have been saved. In Jesus Christ, so that everyone who now calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's God's plan. And in chapter 12, 
uh, Paul begins to turn his attention from the way of salvation to the result of salvation. How are saved people to live in this world? What is different about us now? How are we to operate? How do we come together as the people of God in such a way that we can make a difference in this world, that we can point to him, to his glory, that we can show others his way, teach them his word? He begins, as we talked about a couple weeks ago in the first couple verses, talking to the individual. And he says, you must place your, your body on the altar as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, and, and then be not conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then beginning in verse number three, he turns his attention from the individual to the body. To the family. None of you, he says. Now we're not talking about just one, but we're talking to a collection of people. And he begins teaching the church about what it means to be the church. We need to hear that again this morning. You see, the Holy Spirit, I believe the Holy Spirit is the the founder of, the initiator of what we believe to be now the, the local church. Right, um, we, we see the life of Jesus, but when Jesus uh, ascended into heaven, they were no, there was really no local body of believers meeting together regularly. Then we had the Holy Spirit coming at Pentecost in Acts, and then the rest of the book of Acts, we see the church coming together as we know it. Groups of Christians in different cities beginning to, to gather together for the purpose of serving and worshiping and growing together in Christ. And if the Holy Spirit is the founder of the church, then clearly we see that the Apostle Paul was his mouthpiece during this time. No one has written more prolifically on the initial um, responsibilities, the initial purposes of the church, the initial plan of the church than Paul did in his letters, his epistles that we have uh, that he wrote to these early believers. Now, we've got to keep in mind that when Paul wrote to the church, it was in its seminal stage. It was just a brand new baby church. All across the world, there were young Christians gathering together, just getting started, trying to figure out what it meant to be community together as a community of faith. There were no buildings. There were no budgets. There were no bureaucracies. It was just Christian people gathering together. There was no Roman Catholic. There was no Southern Baptist. It was just Christians coming together, like-minded in the fact that they were people of faith in Jesus Christ. That was what bound them together. And so he, he begins his conversation to them about what it means to come together as a fellowship of believers in Jesus. What is it supposed to look like? Now, that was a couple thousand years ago. Since then, we have built buildings, established budgets, and created bureaucracies, all of which tend to cloud our thinking sometimes about what the church really is and what it's all about. Now we have Catholic and Protestant. We have multitudes of denominations and some churches that decide they don't want to be a part of any of it and call themselves independent and do whatever they want to do or what they believe the Bible teaches them to do. And yet we all have still the self-same instruction about what it means to do what we're doing here this morning, and that instruction is found in the Holy Word of God. This is where the good stuff is. Everything else we have to deal with and kind of work around, but we can't leave this out, right? This is where the source of, of our of our being as a church really is. It's it's where we understand what it means to be who we are and to do what we do as a church. And in Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 3, he looks at a group of believers who are meeting together in and around Rome. 
Both Jews and Gentiles, he's dealt with that conflict, but there are people from all different walks of life, from all different backgrounds, and they have come together under the banner of Jesus Christ. What has brought them together is that they believe that Jesus is the Lord. They have surrendered their life to his lordship. They have received the salvation that comes through him. In almost every other way, they're different. But they have found unity of faith. Now Paul is speaking to this very eclectic group of believers. And I found it interesting to see where he begins his conversation about their relationship with the Lord and their relationship with one another. So follow along as we begin in verse number 3. Listen to, what he, listen to where he begins this conversation. This is his first thing. This is his first word to the early church in and around Rome. Here it comes. What's he going to say first? Look at verse 3. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Now, now we need to take note of this. His very first word of instruction to this newly formed body of believers in Jesus Christ was a call to humility. Did you see that? An understanding of our own depravity an understanding of who we were before Jesus, an understanding of the fact that we are gathering together not because of what we have been able to do for ourselves, but because we all share in this truth. God did something for us that we could never have accomplished on our own. It was a call to humility. You see, humility keeps us connected to the mercies of God. It reminds us that except for God's great mercy, we are not different than anyone else that's lost and broken in this world. It keeps us surrendered to His will. It keeps us dependent on His power. Humility. The Apostle Paul was a student of the Old Testament as a young man. We know him that he was a Pharisee, a Jewish Pharisee, before he became a Christian and surrendered his life to following Jesus. But he had spent his early years studying the history of his own people, the Jews, through the Old Testament. And he had seen a pattern there. It's a pattern that you and I will see if we study the Old Testament. It is a pattern that goes something like this. God delivers his people. He blesses his people. In their blessing, they become haughty. And they go their own way. And then they receive his chastisement and they are broken. In their brokenness, they cry out to the Lord and he hears and responds and he blesses them yet again. And in their blessing, they become haughty again. It's a pattern. You see it throughout the Old Testament. And Paul is writing to this new Christian church and he's reminding them, hey, look, God has done something for you that you cannot do for yourself. Don't let it go to your head. Somehow, we as Christians have taken on this role of being the children of God, and we've pushed it a little too far. Can I say that? We are children of the king. Most of the king's kids are spoiled rotten. <laughs> Think about it. And we begin to act as though we are the elite of God, that we've got something that others don't have, that we have it because we deserve it. And so Paul says, when he begins to write to the church, he says, look, a lot of things are going to happen, and the Holy Spirit of God's going to move among this place, and, and there's, a, there's a movement of God going on in this world. Be very careful that you never think more highly of yourselves than you ought, because that's going to be the temptation. You kind of take a look around you today and you see that 
the church, particularly in the Western world, in many circles has become something that we don't find in the New Testament. It's become a place for the, the famous, a place for the, for the, the rich, a fa- place for the prosperous. And there's even this line of thinking that's going on in many churches in the Western world today that sounds something like this. If you will, will love God and support them, then he will, he will make you great. He will give you good things. He will prosper you. And Paul begins his first word by saying, look, folks, our, our biggest challenge as we begin to receive the blessing of God is to stay humble before him. Never think of yourselves greater than you are. Well, I'll tell you what, there's, a, there's a, a side effect here to this kind of prideful spirit, arrogant spirit that's, that's become ugly in our world today, particularly where the local church is concerned. I, I think that the church today is losing its empathy and compassion We've become angry and embittered with a a broken world. And we have replaced our empathy and compassion with criticism and judgment. Pointing fingers. Making accusations. The Bible consistently calls us back to a place of humility before God to where we recognize our own brokenness, our own depravity. And as we look at the brokenness of this world, our mentor should absolutely be, except by the grace of God, there go I. None of you should look upon yourselves more highly than he ought. He moves from humility. Listen to these next couple of verses. He's given us kind of a summation of of what he sees in the church. And in verse 4 and 5 we read this, For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. So he moves from humility to unity, an understanding of our connection, an understanding of our community with one another. Okay, And he he gives us great example. It's kind of like the perfect example for this this, uh, idea. He says, consider your own body. That's all you have to do to understand where God is, is taking his people, his church. Just kind of take a look at your body and realize that your body is made up of a bunch of different parts. All of these parts have different and unique functions, but they're all important to the whole. Working together, they create a body that functions with great health, in great purpose. Now, when any part of the body is unhealthy or broken or, or sick or afflicted or missing in any way, the whole body then has to adjust. It, it struggles. It suffers because of what is missing. And so he says, coming together in this understanding of community is so critically important because we have one body but many parts, and we need to understand that. We need to respect our differences, and we need to see them as being important to the body of Christ. Now, I want to say something about community here that God has placed on my heart several years ago, and I, I just keep having a hard time getting it across. Uh, I'm going to try again this morning. So I'm going to make a statement, then I'm going to come back and we'll fill in some of the pieces. Here's the statement. Community, Christian community, is a byproduct of faith. Faith is not a byproduct of community. I'm going to say it again. Community 
is a byproduct of faith for the church. Faith is not a byproduct of community. Now let me break that down and tell you what I mean by that. Let's start with community as a byproduct of faith. In the early church, what we see is a group of people who are coming to faith in Christ. That's where it starts. So they've come to faith in Christ. And because they came to faith in Christ, they lost community. They lost connections with family and friends oftentimes. They began to look for a community, a group of other people who were like-minded in their faith where they could come together for worship, for edification, for training, for teaching, for service. And so they started with faith in Christ, and they came together as a group of people who shared faith in Christ and established community. So community became a byproduct of their faith in Jesus Christ. They were looking for a way and a place where they could exercise and grow their faith openly with other believers. Now, he, he mentions the fact that they, they're very different in a lot of other ways. He's already struggled with the fact that some were Jews and some were Gentiles. Some were rich and some were poor. Some were young and some were old. They had political differences. They had social differences. They had economic differences. They were not able to really meet in community over those other things. But what held them together in community was their faith in Christ. We share that in common. So faith began the process. That's the right way. But my second statement was, faith is not a byproduct of community, right? So, so what we have seen in the, in the modern church is an emphasis on community. Follow me. The emphasis is on community, trying to get people connected first. And then we do the old bait and switch. Once we get them here, to tell them, oh, now we're here, we got you here. We want to tell you about Jesus. Now, that sounds pretty good. It sounds like a good outreach program. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to have a softball team. And we're going to get people connected around the softball team. And we're going to use that softball team to ultimately win them to Christ. And that has become kind of a theme of the church. Now, I'm just using softball. I'm not against softball. You know what I'm talking about. Add what, put whatever community connection you're, you're used to being a part of. But that's what we do. We say, let's get them here by hook or crook. And once we get them here and get them established in community, then we can help them with their faith. That sounds good. It's not biblical. There's so many problems in that. The first one being, when people come into community, if they are not sharing community through faith in Christ, they're going to have to find it somewhere else. It is that something else that will become a priority to them. The old saying says, be careful because what you use to get them in, you have to use to keep them in. And there's a truth to that. And the other thing is that there is no other thing out there strong enough to hold a community together that's as diverse as the one we find in America other than faith in Jesus Christ. And so churches have become these mass community centers where we've tried to, to provide community and connection for people. And so people can come together and they can, can play softball or they can drink coffee or they can have their little group meetings or whatever to have community and fellowship. And we've begun doing life together as though that somehow intrinsically will bring people to Christ. It will not. The early church said, no, you know Jesus, come on over here. We want you to be a part of us. The idea was not for people to get saved. Listen to me. was not for people to get saved in the church, but for saved people to come to church. 
That's the New Testament. Community became a byproduct of faith. And somehow, throughout the years, we see faith as a byproduct of community. And we end up with a bunch of people in our world who know Jesus a little bit because they spent a lifetime hanging out with his people. Paul puts it this way. We're part of the same body. You do understand that your hand is not just hanging out with you. It's a part of you. It's connected. And that's what he's talking about, having that kind of of deep connection based on our belief in Jesus Christ. That you and I have something in common that is a stronger bond than anything else this world has to offer. We are one in Christ Jesus. And I want to have community with you. Not because I like just hanging out with you and having casseroles. But because you and I are in love with the same Jesus Christ. And we're a part of his bride. And I'm glad to be in that kind of community with you. Unity. Look at verse 6 through 8. He goes on. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, Let us use them. (laughs) How straightforward is that? Let us use them. It's a good idea. Kind of a novel thing in the church. You know, let's do something. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in his generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Okay. I want you to notice what this, these couple verses are not. These couple verses are not a teaching on spiritual gifts. He's going to do that later. He's going to give an in-depth study on spiritual gifts. That's really not what this paragraph is about. This paragraph just simply says, as a part of the body, you have something to contribute. That's what he wants you to know. It works better when everybody does her or his part. Does that make sense? It's not rocket science. He said, don't think more highly of yourselves than you ought to. Everybody humble yourself. Realize that we are a part of a faith community based on Jesus Christ. We have a bond, and everybody has a job to do. Everybody has a job to do. He's talking about gifts. When we think about gifts, I'm going to challenge you in this way. I think that the Bible speaks of a couple of kinds of God-given gifts. I think there's the kind that God gives us at conception, when he brings our, our DNA strands together to make us who we are. There are God-given gifts that we're born with, if you will. And I think it's undeniable. Oh, for some people, you really do see it. Um, You see this God-given ability to do things that go way beyond the rest of us kind of mere mortals down here trying to keep up. I mean, there's just, there's some people that whether it's music or athletics or art or leadership or what, they're just gifted because of the way they were created. Everybody has something that God has given to you that can be used for his glory and should be used for his glory. You get that at birth. But I think the Bible teaches that there's another set of gifts that we get at rebirth or when we're born again, when we're saved. We refer to those as spiritual gifts. Those kind of go above and beyond our natural God-given gifts that we're born with. However, I believe that they should work together for his glory. All right, let me give you an example. While on vacation, I I read a book about C.S. Lewis. 
uh, one of my favorite authors, has been a favorite author of mine for a long, long time. C.S. Lewis was a soldier in the First World War, and, and while he was a soldier there, he was, he was agno- atheist or maybe agnostic. He didn't really articulate that, but God was not on his radar at all. And he came out of the war very bitter about that. Um, but he was, as, as a non-believer, as an atheist, he was an extremely gifted author. And he wrote several things before he became a follower of Christ. J.R.R. Tolkien, who is the author of the Lord of the Rings series, was a contemporary of his. They worked at Oxford together, and Tolkien actually led Lewis to the Lord one night. It's a great story. So now Lewis is a born-again Christian, and one of the spiritual gifts that God gave to him was the gift of discernment. Very discerning man about people, about culture, about religious things. He just had this unique knack of understanding the world around him. It was a gift of God. And so what did Lewis do? He took his natural God-given gift that he was born with to, to write and to articulate language, and he put it together with his gift of discernment, and he began to write some very insightful books about what is going on spiritually in his world. See how that works? Now, I know that C.S. Lewis is a little... Um, an example that's a little hard to, to, to follow is, is C.S. Lewis. But my question is, what are you doing with your gifts? Maybe I should start with this. What are they? See, the Bible's very clear. You, you're, you're sitting here. You got something. You are a creation of God Almighty. He didn't mess up when he got to you. He gave you certain gifts, abilities. And then if you're a Christian, he has coupled that with these spiritual gifts. Do you even know what they are? Have you thought about it? Have you prayed about it? Have you studied it? Have you gone to the extreme of actually trying to discern your gifts? Now listen, I know the Bible just talked to us us about humility, but don't give me that false humility that says, well, I just can't do anything. When you say that, you're not talking about you. You're talking about your God. Uh, God just kind of messed up with me. I'm just a big old blob of flesh floating around down here until it's time to go to heaven. I'm sorry. You can't help you there. I got nothing. Not according to Scripture. To each is given the gifts and abilities. What is yours? And how are you doing with it? I've often taught that gifts are to be discovered, they are to be developed, and they are to be deployed for the kingdom of God. How about you? You know, tonight we're going to be talking about missions. I hope you're willing to come and be a part of that. But we've been talking a lot about this 5-2 pantry that we're going to have, and it's going to be every other Thursday night. And we know we're going to start slow, but we know it's going to grow fast. It's just the way it is. You start giving people food, they're going to, the word of mouth is going to get going out there, and it's going to grow fast. It'll work 10 of us to death. But 100 of us can get the job done. We need you. The kingdom needs you. Vacation Bible School. A few work really hard and do a, a fair job. But a lot don't have to work nearly so hard and do an amazing job. See, it's, it's the biblical truth. It's the way he says it ought to be. The church. It's a God thing. It's his idea and it's his ideal and it is a good one. I missed you last week. And I pray that in my lifetime, I never have to go an extended period of time without being able to enjoy the fellowship of God's people for any reason. But I want to say one more thing to you in all sincerity. I need you, church. I do. 
You see, here's the, here's the reality. Hell is coming. Mark my word, hell is coming. I get that in the Bible too. It's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. It's coming. We see it coming. Some would argue it's here. I wouldn't want to do that without a family of faith standing with me. We need each other. And God has given us each other. I need you, church. We need what's happening here. Do you miss it when you're not here? Does it matter to you? First pastoral conference I ever attended. 26-year-old pastor of Parkwood Baptist Church, a little struggling church in, in Louisville, Kentucky, and kind of a blue-collar district. And it was a graying church, and very small, seemingly very insignificant. And I went to a conference. The conference leader was standing there. And he had a resume a mile long pastored a big mega church and dozens of things going on and I'm sitting there and thinking what, what, what's he going to say what's he going to ask and I never will forget he started with this question he says I want you to take on your he gave us a little notebook part of the conference he said first page of the notebook I want you to answer your question what does your church offer its community that they really see as needful and necessary and I looked at that blank page and I thought about it for a minute. And my first response was, well, really nothing, I guess. It's kind of sad to say that. But then I had a thought. And I said, we offer them the opportunity to come to church. A place where the family of God meets regularly together to worship him to grow together to encourage one another that's what we offer i've been in the ministry now over 35 years and quite frankly i have not thought of a better answer since the first one that's what we have we offer an opportunity for the children of god to come together together to worship him i missed you last week i'm glad to be here today thank god for the church it was his idea it was a good one let's stand together please jason and the team are going to come and lead in a time of response the invitation is for whosoever will you may come I'm going to go out on a little bit of a limb this morning and speak to those of you who today are where I was last week you're sitting at home and you've watched our service it's not the same it was never intended to be what it has become in our world today. I want to invite you back. If not here, then find somewhere. Somewhere where you can be present with the people of God. Where His Spirit dwells and His Word is being taught. It's the church. And it's God's idea. Thank you for visiting this message from Old Fort Baptist Church. Here at Old Fort, we value biblical truth, missional living, and vital connections. To learn more about who we are and what we do, please visit us online at oldfortbaptist.org.
To help support the ongoing ministry of the church, you can give at oldfortbaptist.org give. Thank you, and God bless.